we're going to talk today about uh, really trying to uh, determine if, if we ourselves are depressed or if someone we uh, know and care about uh, is depressed, and then what uh, we might do uh, in that situation. So we're uh, going to go through a lot of different things, and as Cody said at the end today, we will have uh, an opportunity for uh, some questions, uh, if you could just put those in the chat. All right, well, let's just kind of jump right in. And, and I think one of the issues when we talk about depression uh, that we have to understand is that uh, we use psychological terms in our daily uh, language and our vocabulary very cheaply. Uh, lots of people will tell you that they're depressed. You know, I'm very depressed today and, uh, and things like that. And, and really what they're saying is I'm sad or I'm down today, uh, but they don't really mean that they have a major depressive disorder. Uh, but they use that term. And what happens is people begin uh, to view depression as really little more than sadness. Uh, so if a person is sad, then they're depressed. And, uh, and then, you know, then they begin to minimize uh, when a person really truly has the disorder uh, of major depression. And so, you know, someone will say something along the lines, well, I was depressed and I just did X and I got over it. So you should do the same thing. And what we have to understand is that, um, you know, depressive disorders are serious uh, psychiatric problems. Uh, and they have uh, both environmental and biological aspects to them. And it's way more than just being sad. Sadness uh, is more often than not a part of depression, although sadness isn't necessarily the biggest part of depression. And so we, we want to talk about that as we go through today. So just realize that when I say depression, uh, I'm talking about major depressive disorder or, or something like persistent depressive disorder. So if we look at these two depressive disorders, uh, we see that major depressive disorder is characterized by a major depressive episode, which we're going to talk about, uh, and it lasts at least two weeks, okay? And so, and it also causes the individual to be impaired in their daily functioning. So you can really see there, there's a, there's a period of time that goes by uh, it's two weeks. It's not just one bad day. Uh, it also impairs the abilities, uh, the person's ability to function. So we're talking about a very serious uh, condition here. We're not talking about just being sad. Uh, and then persistent depressive disorder is a little less severe form of depression, but it's very chronic. Uh, the person will have had a kind of a chronically depressed mood for at least two years. They may be able to function uh, in most spheres of their life, uh, but they're just down all the time and they're unable to move beyond that. Uh, we used to refer to that as dysthymia. Uh, that was the term that was used in the past, but now you hear persistent depressive disorder uh, more often. So as I said, uh, for a major depressive disorder, uh, that is characterized by the major depressive episode. So a person to be diagnosed uh, as having major depressive disorder must have had or be having a major depressive episode. And so this is the kind of the definition, the clinical definition of what a major depressive episode looks like. So in my mind, when I say depression, this is what I mean. If I were to say someone is depressed, I would be meaning this description, which would be that they had a persistent depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure in their daily activities, and it's lasted at least two weeks kind of without break. And what's interesting about that is you can see that a person may indeed have a depressed mood. They may be sad, they may be down, but it's also possible for a person to just really have kind of lost interest or pleasure in daily activities or things that they used to enjoy um, and really not show a significant amount of sadness, uh, but they, uh, they really just don't really have any kind of vigor, they don't really get up and do anything, they're, they're not interested in doing things they used to enjoy in the past, uh, and that can be a major component as well. It's, again, it's important that this lasts for at least two weeks without break, and then the four of the following symptoms have to be present, so I'd like to kind of talk about those a little bit, uh, because they're not always clear, and they can go in two different directions. So the first one, for instance, significant weight change or a change in appetite. This may mean that the person gains weight, it may mean that the person loses weight. It means that they eat more, they eat less. Uh, and so it's never exactly clear what uh, this is going to be. Uh, a person who uh, does a lot of emotional eating when they're down uh, may be the person who uh, gains weight and eats more, whereas a person who isolates themselves uh, may not eat as much and their appetite may be suppressed. So, so it could go either way, uh, but there is a change in weight and a change and or a change in appetite. They sleep too much or they sleep too little. 
Uh, some people, when they become depressed, uh, especially those who isolate themselves, will have a tendency to just lay in the bed uh, and all they do is sleep and they just really seem to be tired all the time and they can't get up. Those who uh, have a lot of, say, uh, anxiety that goes along with their depression can become kind of irritable and agitated uh, and they find it almost impossible to sleep. So they'll be awake all night long uh, and unable to go to sleep. Uh, you also find uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation, meaning that the person is uh, moves a lot, they, they have a lot of energy, they move around a lot, or they move very, very little. Uh, a person who has psychomotor retardation literally will move extremely slowly. Uh, they may not even make eye contact with you. They may not lift their head up when you're talking. They may move their body very little, almost hold their arms in a rigid uh, type of way. Uh, and so you could see it again, either way. Um, they have a lot of fatigue uh, or a loss of energy. That's pretty common to depression. Person complains about being tired all the time and not really having any energy. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. Uh, worthless, being worthless is a lot different than uh, being sad. Uh, also, a lot of times you, you get worthlessness mixed with hopelessness. Uh, I don't have any value and there's really no hope for me in the future. Uh, or they're guilty about things they haven't accomplished or should have done. Uh, an inability to concentrate or, or indecisiveness. Uh, the constant ruminations that occur with depression where a person is constantly thinking of negative thoughts, they're not doing this consciously, it's just that their brain is generating negative thoughts over and over. It really takes up a lot of their cognitive strength. And so uh, they're unable to concentrate on things or focus their attention. They're very indecisive, they can't make decisions. And then oftentimes the person has recurrent thoughts of uh, suicide or their death and dying, they focus on uh, things like that. And we're gonna talk about suicide today. So a person who has major depressive has a major depressive episode will have one of the two things I mentioned at the top there. They're gonna be persistently depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure in things that they found pleasurable in the past that has lasted for at least two weeks. And then they have four or more of the following at the bottom. So you can see that there, there may be a little bit different of a manifestation depending on uh, the individual. So it isn't always just that the person is sad. And just being sad, as I said, isn't enough uh, to say that a person is at a, having a major depressive episode. Now, uh, the prevalence and onset of depression. Depression is one of our most common uh, mental health problems. Anxiety disorders are the most common. Uh, and major depressive disorder is the second most common uh, issue. You can see that 16, almost 17% of individuals in the population in the US will have a major depressive disorder. Uh, and about two and a half, well, a persistent depressive disorder, which is much less common uh, than major depressive disorder. Uh, it occurs much more uh, commonly in women than in men, uh, although it certainly does occur in men. And also another reason that that number may be so skewed is that men are much less likely to seek help uh, than women. So we may have a kind of underrepresentation there. The age of onset of the first major depressive episode is usually late out adolescence, or early adulthood. I think it's important to remember that uh, you know half of all mental health problems are in place by 14 years old and 75% by 24 years old. So in that 14 to 24 year old range is where you're gonna see the majority of the major depressive episode first manifestation. Although you certainly can have depression at any age uh, for a first time. So a child uh, as young as um, six, seven, eight years old can manifest a depressive episode. Uh, just like an individual who's never had a depressive episode in their whole life and could be 70 years old or so could uh, suddenly have major depressive episode. It just depends on the circumstances and what's going on with the individual physiologically. Now, I will say that in younger children, uh, the, uh, the, mood, the mood change oftentimes is more irritability than it is sadness. So a child may be, seem irritable and agitated rather than sad. Uh, and so you see that difference in the manifestation. For older adolescents, uh, this certainly is much more like a, a normal adult manifestation where you see, uh, you will see the sadness or the loss of pleasure and interest uh, in things that you commonly found pleasurable. So this is, just gives us an idea, very common disorder. Uh, this is what uh, you need to be on the lookout. This and anxiety disorder is much more common than say something like schizophrenia. All right, well, when we're talking about depression, we're really talking about primarily uh, two uh, neurotransmitter systems in the brain uh, being kind of uh, out of whack. 
uh, might we say. And so the one that we hear about the most, that people talk about the most, is uh, the serotonin system of 5-HT. Uh, and we know that that system is involved in sleep, it's involved in appetite, it's involved in impulse control. And then you see all of these uh, dysfunctional uh, when a person has depression. As I said, with appetite, they may eat too much, they may eat too little, they may not be able to sleep, they may sleep. Uh, so you do see issues there. And then also the norepinephrine system, uh, which is alertness, concentration, motivation. It also is involved in um, kind of sleep as well. And so again, you see those same kind of problems in individuals that are depressed. Uh, and then there in the middle, I have what, what you find when these systems are Kind of dysfunctional, you have a depressed mood, you see heightened anxiety, vague aches and pains, irritability, cognitive functioning issues like problems with attention. And I think it's very important to understand that when people have depression, they indeed uh, do have greater aches and pains. Uh, you may have remember an old commercial for some pharmaceutical uh, that said depression hurts, if you remember that. Uh, and that's a, that's a reality. The alteration in um, these two neurotransmitter systems down the spinal cord uh, actually causes the individual to have a greater sensitivity to pain. And so indeed they do feel more physical pain and aches and, uh, and things like that. And so you also find that these systems are involved in anxiety. So it's not uncommon for us to treat anxiety disorders with the same types of medications. And so depression uh, and anxiety go hand in hand, it's rare that you will ever find someone who has depression who also doesn't have an anxiety issue or someone who has an anxiety disorder who also isn't struggling with depression. Uh, and so uh, they really are kind of uh, related to one another. Uh, a lot of irritability and a lot of cognitive functioning issues. In fact, the cognitive functioning issues are things that the person uh, really complains about probably the most. Uh, oftentimes they don't even complain about the mood uh, they come in and they will say, you know, I just can't think anymore. I'm in a brain fog. I, I can't concentrate. I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, and then they think that it's that that's causing them to have the depressed mood when really it's the depressed mood that's causing all the other things. So you see, we have these two systems going on. Now, certainly our environment plays a huge role in depression and uh, all mental health problems are an interaction between uh, the environment uh, and biology. Uh, but when we treat depression, we tend to focus on these two neurotransmitter systems. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we get towards the end when we talk about treatment. Well, we are all in a global pandemic, unfortunately. And uh, I have to say that uh, we've seen pretty dramatic increases in uh, depression and anxiety uh, as a result of that pandemic. And I think that's what we would expect to see. We wouldn't expect to see increases, say, in schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or things like that. Uh, we would expect to see things that were, you know, caused by isolation, uh, loss of job, uh, loss of uh, social support, loss of interaction, things like that. And you can see here, if you look at the, uh, the yellow bars, January and June 2019, the year before the pandemic, but the first part of the year, you can see, you know, pretty standard what we have seen uh, over the years as far as individual, the percent of individuals that say they're struggling with those symptoms. And then just after the pandemic began or the red bars in May, if you remember the pandemic began in March of 2021. And then by the end of the year in 2020, you see you know, really dramatic increases there in depressive symptoms as well as anxiety issues. And so, so this is something that uh, we should expect to see at heightened rates in our loved ones and ourselves uh, and in those that we work with. Uh, and if we look at children, these are teens. This is a study that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, out of uh, Mott's Children's Hospital, which is part of the University of Michigan system uh, medical school. Um, and you can see this was a, a survey of, um, national survey of parents across the US uh, with teenagers asking if they, uh, if their teenager had uh, either a worsening or a new mental health problem as a result of the pandemic starting. And you can see pretty dramatic increases in both depression and anxiety, even in sleep issues. But as we just learned, we know that the sleep issues are related to the depression and the anxiety. And so uh, I think probably the, while this is overall very disturbing because what they found in that study was 50% of parents said that their child or teen was now uh, now had a mental health issue or had a worsening mental health issue as a result of the pandemic. Uh, you can see that it's uh, much worse in teen girls than it is in teen boys. Uh, and again, we know from previous data 
that depression uh, is more likely to um, to occur in women than in men, although certainly we're seeing increases in men as well. Uh, and so very disturbing, very disturbing uh, uh, research. So let's just talk about kind of the way that we would differentiate, say, say the blues, what we would think about being down or the blues or having a, you know, I'm in a funk today, you hear people say that, uh, versus someone actually having a major depressive disorder and being, or I'm sorry, major depressive episode. Because I think this is really the differentiation that people struggle with, because certainly in depression, we have a subclinical manifestation of lower mood. Uh, we all know what it is to be sad. And many of us know, unfortunately, what it is to be profoundly sad, but only a small percentage of us know what it is to be depressed. And so if we look in the light blue there, uh, we see that uh, this is a description of someone having the blues. And so they're you have a kind of an absence of the normal intensity of your emotions. Uh, you feel dulled or the blahs. I hear people say that a lot. I have the blahs. Uh, they, uh, the intensity of life is kind of missed. They're just not enjoying their daily activities the way they normally do. Now, they may still be doing them, but they're just not getting as much out of them. Uh, their low mood doesn't last as long. Uh, and uh, and it generally has periods of time in which they feel better. Um, so for instance, they might say, you know, I've been really down this week and, you know, a friend says, Hey, let's go see a movie. They go see a movie and they really enjoy the movie. And when they leave the movie, they kind of forgotten that they had a low mood. Their mood is kind of back to normal. And maybe a few hours later, it kind of gets back down again, but there was a period of time in which they felt better. Uh, and then the depressed feeling seems like time spent away from life. I'm just kind of off today. That's another very common thing you hear people say. And what's important about that is they recognize what they were like before. They recognize that, that, that or they, they know what it was like to feel okay, and now they just know they're not. And this is something that usually is very transient. It, it doesn't typically last uh, even two weeks. It might last a few days, maybe even a week. Uh, but there are breaks in it as well. And so, so that's what it is to be down, to be, have the blues. Uh, but then if you look at something uh, when a person is talking about having a major depressive episode, they talk about emotional pain, being in despair, being in a pit, uh, a sense of hopelessness, helplessness. Um, you know, they, their affect is very flat. They don't feel anything. A lot of times they talk about feeling numb. Uh, this is long lasting. As I said before, it lasts at least two weeks before you can even, uh, you can even uh, diagnose it. It's uninterrupted. It's persistent. You, there's nothing you can really do to draw this person kind of up and out of that darkness. Uh, and it really, over time, becomes a way of life. They will refer to themselves as, I am just depressed. Uh, that's who I am. That's, that's what I am now. Uh, you know, and I don't remember, they, they literally cannot really emotionally remember what it was like not to be depressed. And because of that, they can't look to a future where they won't be depressed. They don't know what it is like not to be that way. So it's a, it's a much more intense, a much deeper, dark, darker sense. You know, we talk about things like hopelessness and helplessness and worthlessness. Those are not things that you hear when someone's just describing the blues. So, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go through and we talk about how you might determine if you or your, or one of your friends or loved one is struggling with depression. You know, it, it's the, it's kind of the intensity and the chronicity of it. How long has it lasted and how deep is it uh, to kind of help you determine whether it's some kind of a subclinical kind of sadness or being down versus an actual disorder. Now, let's talk about how we would assess someone. How would we determine if uh, we ourselves are struggling or if, um, say, a loved one is struggling uh, or, a, or even a coworker? So typically, a clinician, we will start out by looking at the big, what we call the big three, okay? So you have most people in their lives have the big, you know, they have spheres of, of daily activity or daily living. So most, many of us go to work, okay? That's one sphere of living. Uh, many of us or all of us have relationships. That's another sphere of living. Uh, now, some of us are also going to school or younger individuals go to school instead of working. And so that's a sphere of daily living. And, and sometimes when a person doesn't work or they don't go to school, the, the third sphere might just be activities kind of outside the home or things that you do uh, that aren't 
at work or aren't at school, but things outside. So, so usually everyone has three of those in some way. And what we do is we ask that individual or we ask their loved ones how they are functioning in each one of those spheres. So are you able to go to work? Are you able to do your job? Are you performing in your job as well as you always have performed in your job? Or has that begun to fall off? Uh, do you find it hard to get up in the morning and, and sometimes you miss work? Uh, same thing with school. What about your relationships? Are you isolating yourself? Have you lost relationships? Are you in conflict with your relationships? Are others telling you that you have a problem and because you don't feel you have a problem, you're now you know, distancing yourself from them. So how are you doing in these kind of spheres of daily living? What we find typically is that when a person has a mental health problem, and in this instance, we're talking about depression, when a person has a major depressive disorder, they are not likely to be functioning normally in all spheres of their daily living. Uh, in fact, it's likely that at least one of them, uh, they are dysfunctional. Uh, it's likely there's probably more than one, but certainly in one of them. Uh, you know, it depends on what a person's job is. It depends on how many relationships they have. Uh, and it depends on how long whatever it is that we're dealing with has been going on. So if we're just real early in this and it's just been a couple of weeks, uh, then it may just have been affecting their job a little bit, maybe not affect their relationships as much or affecting their schoolwork. Uh, if it's longer term, it may affect their relationships and so forth. So you want to ask the individual or you want to kind of observe how are they doing in those daily spheres of living. And this is going to be one of the ways that you can help them understand that they are struggling because they may not even fully understand that they aren't doing so well in one of those spheres. So again, we're looking for impairment or dysfunction in at least one area of daily living. Now, this is an assessment called the PHQ, the Patient Health Questionnaire. Uh, this is a nine item version. And this just kind of, you know, I don't necessarily expect you to memorize these, but it it gives you an idea of how, what, what types of questions you might ask a person uh, to get a sense of really the depth of what they're dealing with. This actually is a scale and, and we can score it and, and all that, but just gives you an idea. So, that, so again, look at it in this context. You're, you're asking this person or you're thinking about how this person's functioning over the last two weeks, okay? So remember, two weeks is that kind of cutoff for uh, depression, it the, the symptoms have to have been there for two weeks. And so um, little interest or pleasure in doing things. Okay, well, uh, that's something that you may not even have to ask the person, you may just notice that if this is your loved one, or, or a close family friend, or even yourself, you may find I, you know, I haven't been interested in doing things, you know, I love to work in the garden, and I just have no interest in doing that. And it's been going on for more than two weeks now. Uh, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Okay, again, you know, this is something that might just come out in conversation. Trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much. Again, uh, you know, this, this may come out in conversation. This may be uh, something where the person says to you, yeah, you know, I've really, I've overslept so much lately. I've missed work three or four times. Well, you know, there's a, a perfect example of how these symptoms begin to kind of work their way into affecting your, your spheres of life. Uh, because the person's oversleeping, they're now having troubles at work. Feeling tired or having little energy, there's the fatigue, poor appetite or overeating. So these are questions that we actually would go through and ask someone during an assessment to, to get a sense of whether they actually meet criteria. But if you kind of look at these in a general sense, um, these are things that the person might be talking to you about. These are things that you could easily just ask them about, you know, how they're, how they're doing, con can they concentrate? Um, you know, you, you can observe how they move or speak, um, and certainly about thoughts of being better off dead or thoughts of harming themselves. I mean, what we see a lot of times now is that uh, people don't necessarily, you know, they won't necessarily be talking about that, but they'll be posting about that. So they'll post on their social media uh, or on blogs, uh, you know, the kind of uh, a lot of kind of preoccupation with death and dying. Uh, people don't tend to tell you straight out that they're thinking about harming themselves, they say things like, it'd be better off if I just went to sleep and never woke up, uh, things like that. So this is just gives you an idea of, uh, of what you might ask a person or the kind of conversation you might have or the things you might watch for in conversation. And if you did use this as an assessment, as, as we do clinically, you can see that uh, when a person has a score of less than four on this, 
uh, four or less, uh, that's really no depression. But more than four, uh, you really see you seem to be start to get concerned. And so uh, just a just a way to think about. It. So again, you're you're looking at the way they're functioning in their their spheres of daily living, or you're asking yourself that: How am I doing with my relationships? How am I doing uh, at work or school? How am I doing in activities outside my home or outside of work? Uh, you know, are you isolating yourself? I mean, one of the things is you might say, well, my relationships are fine. But well, when was the last time you saw the people that you were in those relationships with uh, in person? I don't mean you texted them. I don't mean that you, you know, you saw them online. I mean, you saw them in person. Are you isolating yourself? Oftentimes, people that are struggling with depression begin to isolate themselves because it just feels better to them to be alone uh, and with their thoughts than it feels to be with others. And they oftentimes just don't have the energy uh, to deal with uh, being around others. And so that just gives, kind of gives you a sense of the things you might ask for. So you're looking at the spheres of influence. You're looking at these questions about mood. You're looking at questions about eating and sleeping, how they're concentrating, uh, those types of things, just to get a sense. Remember, all of those things I listed out, which are really basically represented here in these questions, you only have to have four out of all of them. You don't have to have all of them. Uh, really, what we're looking at first is a depressed mood or a reduced or reduced interest in pleasurable activities uh, that lasts at least two weeks. All right, so let's talk about suicidality because people that have depression are a much higher uh, risk for suicide than those that do not. Uh, although depression isn't the only mental health problem in which people uh, are likely you know, have a higher rate of, of, of suicide, but certainly su depression is probably one of the highest, if not the highest. Uh, and so suicidality goes well beyond the idea of just somebody making an attempt on their life or actually taking their life. Uh, it's much broader than that. So we really need to think about people that have suicidal thoughts. And you can see uh, last year, 12 million people had suicidal thoughts. Uh, and then there's a smaller subset of those individuals. So that's a lot of people. Actually, I think a lot of people are surprised by that number. Uh, then there's a smaller subset of those people uh, that will then make an actual plan to harm themselves. And then a smaller subset of those people will actually make an attempt on their life. And then uh, a smaller, which is not represented here, subset of those individuals will actually die as a result of that attempt. Uh, and you can see that a majority of people that make an attempt, a vast majority of people that make an attempt, did make a plan. And so that's an important piece of information that we need uh, to have. Uh, and so uh, we need to think about that. And we're gonna talk about that as we talk about assessing for suicidality. So unfortunately, suicide is the, the 10th leading cause of death in the US. Uh, we'll tell you, unfortunately, last year it got moved for the first time and as many times, as I, many years as I could ever remember to the 11th uh, leading cause of death because COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death and that didn't even occur uh, prior to last year. And so, um, so it'll be back to the 10th leading cause of death next year or this year, unfortunately. It is the second leading cause of death for individuals 10 to 34 years old. Uh, and I really think you have to think about that for a minute because that means that the second leading cause of death for really older children and all adolescents is suicide. Uh, and the leading cause of death is accidents, and it always has been for individuals that young. Um, but that's pretty disturbing that in the United States today, the, leading, the second leading cause of death for 10-year-old children is suicide. Uh, there was a time when we have not, you know, rarely ever have heard about a child uh, you know, 10 years old harming themselves. And unfortunately now, uh, while still uncommon, it's becoming more and more common. Women have more suicidal thoughts, and they make more attempts uh, at suicide than men do. Uh, men uh, are more successful uh, with their suicide attempts, and so more men die by suicide. So 70% of all deaths by suicide are men, and that's because men use more lethal means, uh, whereas women tend to use less lethal means. Uh, 90 more than 90% of people who die by suicide are suffering with a mental health problem at the time of their death. Uh, and so we have to understand that, you know, when we're talking about suicide, we're talking about really the terminal end of a mental health problem. Uh, and as I said before, people that have depression, which we're talking about today, are at a significantly higher rate for suicide uh, than the general population. Uh, the, the rate of suicide is highest among middle-aged white men. Middle-aged white men represent the vast majority of suicides. 
Uh, and then uh, kind of a myth that we have to get beyond is this idea that asking someone the suicide question, meaning, uh, are you thinking about harming yourself, uh, does not increase their risk of suicide. It actually diminishes their risk of suicide. It makes it less likely uh, that they will commit suicide. So uh, you're not going to put this into somebody's uh, mind. And I think you can just do a, you know, do a little mind game on yourself. I mean, you think about it, if I just walked into your office and you were sitting there and I said, at this moment, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Or are you thinking about killing yourself or however I might say it? That doesn't make you suddenly begin to think about that the rest of the day. So a person that isn't struggling with those types of things already, that certainly isn't going to put that on their mind. And a person who is struggling with those thoughts, it gives them an opportunity to discuss them and, and kind of you know, talk about them and makes it less likely that they will harm themselves. So if we believe that somebody is suicidal, if someone says something to you that makes you think that, so what they might say to you is something like, you know, my family would be better off if I just, you know, was in a car accident and died. Uh, my family would be better off if I just went to sleep and never woke up. I wish I'd never been born. Uh, you know, the world would be a better place. Uh, I, you know, I, there's no hope for the future. I'm not even sure it's worth living anymore. Something like, something along those lines. Again, people don't normally just walk up to you, even if you're close to them and just say, I'm thinking about suicide. So they do sometimes, but rarely. So they make you think that they might be considering harming themselves. Well, if they do that, then you need to ask them some very difficult questions. So remember, you are not going to put the idea of suicide in their head. So it's okay to ask these questions. So you need to very overtly ask them, if you're concerned, are you thinking about harming yourself? Are you thinking about, I usually say killing yourself. Uh, people don't like the term suicide. It's a very salient word emotionally and people kind of run away from it. So are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Uh, you ask them that. Now they don't necessarily have to say yes to make you still be concerned. They could say no and how they say no can make you still be concerned, but you need to ask them and you need to see what the response is. After they respond to you, if you're still concerned, you need to go a little further. Because remember the vast majority of people that make a suicide attempt have made a plan of how they're going to do it. And so you ask them, do you, well, if you do, did do it, how would you do it? Uh, and, you know, if they give you a well thought out plan of how they would do it, that's very disconcerting. I and mean, that's a great risk factor. So, you know, a client that told me that he would hang himself and that he already bought a rope and it was in the garage. Well, that's a very bad sign. I mean, he's told me how he's going to do it and he's always already planned to do it. And number three, he already has the lethal means. A person who says, well, I'd probably shoot myself, but you know, they don't own a gun. I'd have to go buy a gun. Yeah, that's a much less uh, kind of concerning situation. I mean, it still may be concerning if they're having the thoughts, but they're not imminently suicidal at that, you know, that kind of moment. So, uh, so you want to get the information to these uh, questions. And after getting this information, if you're concerned, you need to act. Uh, and, you know, if it's a loved one or a friend, you want to drive them to an ER or a crisis clinic. And if it's uh, somebody that isn't willing to go to that, or it's somebody that you don't really know that well, you might call 911 and just explain to the 911 operator it's a mental health issue, uh, and you'd like somebody to come out and uh, and help you with that. And they can send out a specially trained police officer that can help you uh, assess the situation and get the person to care. But again, I, I mentioned the suicidality in the context of depression because, as I said, it's a very high rate of suicide among people that are depressed. Uh, because of the, the really overwhelming kind of hopelessness uh, that goes with suicide. And also you'll hear this, I, uh, goes with depression, and also you hear this idea of wanting to escape the pain. Uh, and there's a lot of mental pain uh, that goes along with depression, but there's also a lot of physical pain that goes along with depression, as I said before. And so the, the, I, the thought is, in the person's mind, is that there's no way I will ever move beyond where I am right now. I've become a burden to others. I'm a drag on my family. Uh, I'm in so much, so much psychic pain and physical pain that I will never be able to move beyond this. And the only way out of this is for me to die. Uh, so when a person commits suicide, and I don't like the term commit because it makes you, it's like commit a sin or commit a crime. When a person dies by suicide, uh, they actually believed at the time 
uh, that they made that decision, uh, that they're doing a, you know, a good thing for themselves and for others. They're not really reasoning this out fully. Because remember, with depression, as we've been talking, uh, there's an impact on your cognitive functioning. So the person really isn't able to, to effectively reason this out. Okay. And so, so let's be cognizant of this as we, as we talk to people that may, may have depression. All right. So how do you treat depression? Uh, one of the good things that I can say is that uh, depression is a, a highly treatable uh, disorder. Uh, in fact, one of our most treatable disorders, and we have a number of, of effective treatments that exist. Now, again, people are going to vary in the severity of their depression. Uh, there are going to be, you know, so we've already talked about kind of a continuum here where there's a subclinical manifestation that we might refer to as the blues or being down or, you know, whatever we might call that. You cross a line into disorder when you become dysfunctional, and there's a, there's a longer period of time in which it exists. But even once you cross the line of disorder, there's a severity, there's mild, moderate, and severe depression. And so some people are going to respond uh, very quickly to kind of minimal treatment. Other people may ultimately be medication non-responsive, and it may take longer uh, for them to, uh, to find some remedy. So let's talk about some of these treatments. Uh, the first line of treatment uh, in, for almost any mental health problem today is medication. Now that's unfortunate because depression, uh, for instance, uh, can be in many instances treated just with therapy, just with talking therapy. Uh, and we do jump to medication very quickly for most things, but antidepressants are, are highly effective for individuals. Uh, and we, I have there the SSRIs and the SNRIs. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They focus specifically on serotonin, where SNRIs are the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. They focus specifically on norepinephrine. Now, there are other antidepressants that are less specific, and they hit a broad range of, of mental health, or I'm sorry, neurotransmitter pathways and, and levels. Uh, but these tend to be your kind of the two primary uh, classes of antidepressants that are prescribed today. Uh, and so they can be very, very effective. Now, uh, what we find with any mental health problem is that when people uh, receive psychotherapy or talking therapy and medication, that's always the best uh, treatment approach rather than taking one, just medication by itself. And typically people that receive therapy are also able to take less medication. So uh, the best therapeutic intervention or psychotherapeutic intervention for depression is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is sometimes called CBT, which has been demonstrated to be highly effective at treating depression. Uh, and so if you are a person with depression or you have a loved one or a friend, you're trying to get them uh, to a therapist, you want to make sure that that therapist practices, uh, you know, a, a an evidence-based treatment for depression and cognitive behavior therapy, in my opinion, is the best therapeutic approach. So you want to ask them, what is their therapeutic approach? How will they treat this individual? Uh, and so um, medication, just for reminder, comes from a physician that comes from a psychiatrist or, or a primary care physician. Psychotherapy would be either from a master's level therapist or a, a doctoral level therapist. Uh, and then for those who are... Um, you know, perhaps medication non-responsive. Uh, there is electroconvulsive therapy, which is, you know, sometimes kind of wrongly referred to as shock therapy, uh, where a, an electrical current is kind of run through the brain. Uh, it, allow, it causes the person to have a, a, a mild seizure. Uh, usually receive a, a number of, of these um, ECT treatments over the span of, say, a two to three week period, somewhere between eight to 12. Uh, and you may have a follow-up down the road, but it can be extremely effective, particularly for people that are not responsive to medication. Uh, and so, you know, put that in context, if you have major depressive disorder, you're not responsive to medication, you have suicidal thoughts, uh, it's certainly uh, worth uh, moving to a more invasive therapy like electroconvulsive therapy than to remain untreated and, and perhaps uh, have suicidal experience. Uh, and then there's a more, uh, uh, a very more recent treating uh, treatment, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, which also is similar to ECT, but not nearly as invasive. In transcranial magnetic stimulation, a very large magnet, I mean, it's just a little device that's put right here over the frontal lobes. 
and a magnetic current is generated. Um, you don't feel it. Uh, and you sit there for about 45 minutes. And again, like ECT, you receive multiple treatments over a several week period. Uh, and what that's, it, it acted, it kind of stimulates the cortex of your frontal lobe. And it has been shown uh, to be effective at minimizing depressive symptoms. It's just done in the doctor's office if they have the equipment for it. Uh, you don't have to be uh, anesthetized or anything. In electroconvulsive therapy, you are, you're fully anesthetized. You're, you're given a, a a medication that paralyzes you so that you don't move about during the seizure. Uh, and you also can have some uh, memory loss as a result, uh, not long-term memory, but short-term memory loss. Whereas transcranial magnetic stimulation, you don't, you don't have that kind of invasive uh, uh, effect. And so, uh, but it can be effective uh, for certain individuals and certainly something uh, to look into, particularly if a person is not responding uh, to medication. Again, Typically, medication is the first line. Uh, I recommend that people receive psychotherapy and medication always together. And then these others are, are usually followed along if there's not as good of response to medication. I have to say with um, psychiatric medication, you have to understand that um, you know, not everyone responds the same way. So one person that's treated with depression with an SSRI and then another person with depression is treated with the same SSRI, they may not have the same effect. And so it can take some time uh, to find the right medication, uh, but therapy being done at the same time can really help uh, the individual begin to minimize their symptoms. All right, so for those of you who might find that you are struggling, Cody mentioned at the beginning, if you're struggling or you have a friend that's struggling or you just need to talk to somebody or to get some referrals uh, to a mental health care provider, uh, we do run a nightly uh, support line, the Houston Hope Line. Um, uh, you can call from anywhere, though. We have calls from all over the country. But uh, this is the number, 832-831-7337. Uh, you will talk to a trained operator who can provide you 20 to 30 minutes of counseling. And then they also can give you referrals to a mental health care provider. What's nice about the Hope Line is that you can call back if you need to call back the next night. It's not a crisis line. It's not for people who are uh, you know, in crisis and about to harm themselves or something like that. It's for people who are in distress, people who are down and they need to talk to somebody uh, and uh, having someone kind of help you work through that issue. And so uh, please take advantage of that. It's seven days a week and it's five in the evening to eight o'clock in the evening. So 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. And it's seven days a week. If someone calls on an off hour, they can leave a message uh, and, um, and they'll get a call back. There's also a HoustonHopeLine.com, uh, which is a website where you also can leave a message and someone will call you back. So that's just a kind of a quick way that you could get some assistance uh, with kind of thinking through the issue. So again, if you are struggling with any of these problems and uh, you wanna look for resources, you might go to our mentalhealthgateway.org website. Uh, there you will find lots of information on all types of mental health problems, including depression. You'll find training for individuals. You'll find uh, databases where you can put in your zip code and, and help you find providers. And then there's also our hopeandhealingcenter.org website, which is for our, our main uh, organization. If you want to learn more about what we do and here in the Houston area and the services that we offer, a mental health gateway is, uh, is available for everyone everywhere. And so that just gives you an idea of depression. I think that hopefully that helps you get a good sense of someone that you might be concerned about or yourself, uh, what you're watching for. I think the main thing is I would say before we take some questions is this idea that you really need to, uh, you know, it's a change from where a person was. Uh, it, it, it's not that uh, the person has just kind of always been this way and now you're concerned about them. Uh, there was a time when they, work this way. So particularly if that's happened over the last month or so, you've seen a change in behavior, you've seen a change in mood, uh, you've seen a change in the way that they are functioning. Uh, that's when you should be concerned, not just that, hey, you know, I think Jim is kind of a down guy all the time. And I've ever since I met him, he's been down and I've known him for five years. I wonder if he has depression. Well, that's not really the situation. You're really looking for a change. Uh, and it's much easier uh, to determine that a person has a mental health condition than it is uh, what people think it is actually. And so really all you're saying to that person is, hey, you know what? I, I think that it would help you because uh, I'm concerned about you 
to just go meet a mental health care provider and talk to them. Let the mental health care provider decide whether you have to come back or not. But I'm worried about you. That's the presentation you have to make. You don't have to tell the person, I think you have depression. I think you have this. I think you have that. Just say, I'm concerned about where you are. Uh, you've complained about certain things. You're, you know, you're not doing well in this sphere of your life. Uh, I think it would be helpful if we got somebody to, to talk to you. Uh, you know, call the call the hope line. Uh, just check it out. Uh, just see what you think.